Turn your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and also Acts 18, because we'll be looking at both of those. So you might keep both of them kind of marked down just a little bit. We're beginning a new study this morning. We finished up Romans last week. We're going to move into 1 Corinthians. And I always, before I start a book, I like to do a little bit of an introduction to the book. Uh, so that's what we'll do today, an introduction to 1 Corinthians. We'll do sort of a little background and then maybe an outline of the book itself and see where it's going uh, in its teaching. The author of the book, of course, is the Apostle Paul. You can see that in the first verse. Uh, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. In ancient times, they signed their letters at the beginning. We sign ours at the end, but in, in those days they signed them at the beginning, and so that's, he's identifying himself as the uh, author of the book. It's possible, we don't know this for sure, but we do know that Paul often had other people write uh, his letters for him. He would dictate and they would write. So it's possible that Sosthenes was the actual writer, because uh, he mentions him and Sosthenes together, uh, but that's not with 100% certainty. That's just a possibility. Um, the place from which he wrote this, we touched on this last week. Did anybody remember? He wrote this from Ephesus. Yeah, chapter 16. Uh, if you flip out there, chapter 16 and verse 8 and 9, Paul tells us right where he's at as he writes this letter. He said, I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So, this goes back to Acts, 9, uh, Acts 19, excuse me, when he spent those three years in Ephesus. Sometime during that three-year period, he wrote this letter to the Corinthians. Um, he's writing to the church of God, which is at Corinth, you see back in chapter 1, verse 2. I thought it was the church of Christ. It is, that's right. Christ is God. So to say one is to say the other. To say church of Christ is to say church of God. To say church of God uh, is the church of Christ. It's one and the same thing. Uh, no difference at all. Uh, the time of this writing is probably, based upon it being written from Ephesus, uh, probably around A.D. 56, give or take a year or two. A.D. 56. So uh, Jesus died in A.D. 30. So this is 26 years after Jesus died on the cross that Paul is writing this uh, letter. Uh, a little bit of the church at Corinth, a little bit about its origin. Now it takes us back to Acts 18, if you want to turn back there uh, with me in your Bibles. This tells us about the origins of the church. Uh, and we'll probably look at all of the first uh, 11 verses or so here. After these things, Paul departed, Acts 18, verse 1, departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them, and so that because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and he said, Your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justus, who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision by the night, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city." And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So Paul spends about a year and a half in Corinth uh, starting this congregation. This is on what's called the second missionary journey. The first missionary journey is Acts 13 14. Uh, then right about uh, close to the end of chapter 15, they go on a second journey. Their original intent was to go back to all the churches on the first missionary journey and visit them. But then Paul and Barnabas had that little dispute, remember, about John Mark. And so they went separate ways. One went one way and one went another. And on Paul's journeys, on the second missionary journey, he eventually comes to Corinth. Now, this church uh, in Corinth, you, you think about the beginnings of it, you see that there's some influence here from Aquila and Priscilla in verse 2. Uh, they, he met them in Corinth, and they went into business together. They were both tent makers by occupation, Priscilla and Aquila and Paul. They were all tent makers by occupation. 
So they went into business together to support themselves while they preached the gospel. And of course on Saturdays then, in verse 4, he goes in the synagogue and preaches. You've got a ready-made audience. You go into the city, uh, Paul said the gospel to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That was his pattern. Every time he went into a city, if there was a synagogue or a gathering of Jews, he would go there first because you've had a ready-made audience looking for the Messiah. So that's the logical place to start. And, but notice in verse 4 of chapter 18, he persuades both Jews and Greeks. It was common for Greeks to visit the synagogues. Uh, that's how many of the Gentiles would learn about God. They would, they would visit these Jewish synagogues. And so as he preaches in the synagogue, he's, there's Jews and Greeks in the audience, and he's persuading both. So the church at Corinth is made up of both Jews and Greeks, uh, which accounts for some of the things that he says in the Corinthian letter. Uh, but some of that stuff is just very important to realize. Um, the Jews eventually, and again, this is, this is not all the Jews because some of them were persuaded, verse 4, but the Jews as a whole, uh, verse 6, uh, opposed Paul and they blasphemed. And so Paul says, okay, I'm done with you. I'll move on to the Gentiles. I'm not going to let that stop me. I'm going to keep preaching. Uh, and verse uh, 8, Crispus, and Paul will mention him in the Corinthian letter. I baptized the household of, of Gaius and Crispus, and so he'll mention him. Uh, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all of his household, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Now, notice how that tracks with the Great Commission. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Notice how verse 8 of Acts uh, 18 coincides and tracks very nicely with the Great Commission. There's no discrepancy there. What Jesus told them to do, that's what they're doing. Uh, if you're Paul and you got opposition from Jews, you might be a little fearful. So he gets some encouragement from Jesus in verse 9 and 10. Don't be afraid. I know the Jews have blasphemed and they've stood up against you, but don't be afraid. Uh, I have many people in this city. What does he mean by that? If they've not been converted yet, how does God have many people? He knows their hearts. He knows their real. He knows, uh, you know, uh, the pe there was people during this transition time that were probably that have been trying to serve God the best they knew how. And so, and God would know those, and so those that, that had the right heart, I believe he yeah. knew them. Yeah, God knows who's going to obey the gospel. So he, he said, I've got people here, don't be afraid. There's going to be people who will listen. You're, you're going to get this work started. And in fact, nobody's going to bother you here as far as harming you. Uh, you might be opposed, but you're not going to be harmed. And so he continued there a year and six months. So that's how the church got started. Uh, this church also felt the influence of Apollos, dropping down here to uh, verse 24. Remember Apollos? Now this is, I know this is talking about Ephesus, but Corinth also felt the influence of Apollos because you remember in 1 Corinthians 1, they, one of the things they were saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. So Apollos had some influence at Corinth. Uh, and that his influence was known there and felt there. And Peter, apparently. I'm a Peter and I'm of Christ. So apparently Peter's influence was felt at Corinth as well. Uh, and that's important. So they had the, the access. They were blessed to have access to the Apostle Paul, uh, to Priscilla and Aquila, to Peter, and uh, uh, to Apollos. So they had access to a lot of very fine gospel preachers uh, in their early days. Um, there were, going back to 1 Corinthians now, uh, chapter 7 is what I'm going to look at here. 1 Corinthians 7. There were uh, differences in the church on a social economic level. That is to say, they weren't all of the same social class. And you can see evidence of that in 1 Corinthians 7 verses, uh, uh, I'll find it here in a second, 20 to 24 where Paul says, let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? So they had slaves in the congregation at Corinth. Were you called while a slave? Don't be concerned about it, but if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who is called while a slave is the Lord free man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. For you were bought with the price, do not become the slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in the same in the state in which he was called. So you see that there were social economic differences. There were slaves and there were free. So you had, different, you had differences in that respect in the church at Corinth. You're trying to see a congregation here with a variety of backgrounds. And that's usually the case in just about any congregation you go to. 
there'll be a wide variety of backgrounds. You also have a little bit of rich versus poor. You see that in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verse 22, when he was talking, when they were perverting the Lord's Supper, there's a little something he says there that gives us an indication that there, was, there were rich and poor people in the congregation. He says, what, do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? That's the poor. So the rich were coming ahead of the poor, eating their own supper instead of the Lord's Supper, and excluding the poor. So they had some differences there in terms of the, uh, of the hoity-toity rich folks and the poor folks, and they didn't want to get along, they didn't want to be together, and so that's, a, that's an issue they had. It even affected their observance of the Lord's Supper. So you see this congregation is made up of Jews and Gentiles, of rich and poor, and of slave and free. So it's, made, it's a very diverse congregation. Lots of different kinds of people from lots of different backgrounds in the church at Corinth. Now in that society of Corinth, and it was not just, I don't think it was limited to Corinth, but certainly it comes out there, there was a pride in intellectualism. Uh, there was a lot of philosophers that would travel around in the, in the first century, and they would go into these cities and, and uh, they would preach their wisdom, their human wisdom, and they would draw a crowd, they would draw a following. And it seems like the brethren at Corinth kind of looked at, at the apostles in that way. That's what led to this whole thing of the I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos. They saw them as competing philosophers. And so who's your guy? Who's your favorite guy? Who's your best speaker? Who's the one that, that, that you really identify with? And so that was causing a problem. They had a bad case of preacheritis. And uh, probably because of this idea of, of these uh, philosophers that went around. Let me go back here to chapter 1 for just a second. In verse uh, 17. He says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. That's those, that was a reference to those philosophers who would come in and try and razzle-dazzle you with their great wisdom. He even mentions it again in chapter 2 and verse 1. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now Paul's not saying he's a dummy. That's not what he's saying. He was quite capable of expressing excellence of speech and wisdom. He was very capable of that. But he said, I didn't rely on that. I relied on the message. I relied on Christ and Him crucified. I didn't try to razzle-dazzle you with my excellency of speech, with my great speaking abilities and, and, and all of that. And, and so the, the Corinthians were placing a premium on that. Uh, in fact, in 2 Corinthians, they even make a little slurry remark to Paul. Uh, his, uh, how was it they put it? His bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. So they didn't, they, some of them didn't like Paul for that. <laughs> you know, you don't measure up to some of these other guys. You're not as good of a speaker as they are and you're not as handsome as some of them are. And so they were, they were making little remarks about, to Paul about that. So they have this kind of a competing philosophy that's trying to enter into the church, this, this love of human wisdom. And that's what led to that whole preacheritis problem that they had. They had problems with factions. Yes, Gene. In that verse 17 where it says, Christ sent me not to baptize. Yeah. Some of our Baptist friends say they see if baptism saves you, he would have sent Paul instead of not sending. Yeah, they love that verse. That's one of their favorite verses. Uh, in fact, uh, back in verse, uh, where is it, 14? Yeah. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Now, this is, this is something you can say back to your Baptist friends because they do believe in baptism. They just don't believe in baptism for the remission of sins. The reason they're called Baptists is because they believe in baptism. Uh, baptism by immersion. And that's, that's where they got their name, Baptist. Uh, and, and they took that in opposition to the Methodists who would sprinkle or pour. So they believe in baptism by immersion, but not for the remission of sins. But if you take verse 14, I thank God I baptized none of you. You can say, well, in other words, Paul is saying, I thank God I made none of you Baptists. Because you have to be baptized to be a Baptist. <laughs> you don't have to be, according to them, you don't have to be baptized to be saved, but you do have to be baptized to be a Baptist. Uh, and so you can say, well, Paul must be saying there, I thank God I made none of you Baptists. And of course, the whole thing is out of context. You know, and we'll come to that a little bit later. Yes. We need to make note that John was not a Baptist 
John was a baptizer. A baptizer. That's what the word Baptist means. John the Baptist. John the baptizer. That's what that. Yeah, exactly. One more thing. <clears throat> Church of God here on earth now is a big difference in the Church of Christ. Yes, same in the Bible, but it's different here on earth. Yeah, that that is true. That what we call what people call the Church of God today is no kin to us at all in, in any way, shape, or form. That is true. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I was going to say oh, about the verse 17. What you brought up: Christ did not send me to baptize. The word baptize there. Is talking about the person doing the baptizing. And Paul is basically saying, Christ didn't send me to do the baptizing. Anybody can baptize you. It doesn't make any difference who baptizes you. He didn't send me to actually do He sent me to preach. My mission is to preach. And, and that goes back to why they were fighting. I'm of Paul and I'm of... They were fighting over the person who baptized them. That's what, that's what brought all that about. Uh, I'm in Paul's camp because he baptized me. I'm in Apollos' camp because he, and he, Paul said, I, I, Christ didn't send me to baptize. It doesn't make any difference who does the baptizing. That's irrelevant. Who baptized you doesn't matter. That's, that, that means nothing. Uh, my job is to preach and not to, not to get converts to me, you know, baptizing him and making him of Paul. That's not, that's not what I'm about. So that's the context of that. And we'll cover that more in detail uh, when we get into the text. But I, I wanted to mention that since it came up uh, in the discussion. They're of John the Baptist. Is what the yeah, 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 they're, yeah, they're, they're claiming that John the Baptist was the founder of the Baptist church and that they're of him. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. Um, trying to think what else I want to throw in here about the church. They had factious brethren, uh, chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. That implies they weren't speaking the same thing. So I want you to speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. That implies that there are divisions. And he goes on to elaborate that, there, that those divisions and how they weren't speaking the same thing. You know, if one of you says, I'm of Paul, and one of you says, I'm of Apollos, you're not speaking the same thing. You're not on the same page. Uh, so that was the sense in which they weren't speaking the same thing, and that was the sense in which they had divisions because they were divided internally. Uh, we sometimes apply this passage broader to denominations. I think it does apply, but understand that in context, he's talking about internal divisions within a congregation. You know, be like uh, this bunch over here saying, I'm of Paul, and that bunch back there saying, I'm of Apollos. It was within a congregation that these divisions took place. Uh, and so there was factions, there was problems, all sorts of problems here in this church. I think that that's exactly how denominations start. Yeah. You know, this group has a little different idea. They believe it, look at it a little different. Yep. But they get enough together to split off and now we're this, you know. Yep. And, and they make a different name to distinct, to make them distinct from the group they come off of. Yep. That's exactly that's right. That's what happened all through the years. Now, uh, Corinth was an immoral city. There was even a saying uh, to live like a Corinthian. And, and so if you said he lives like a Corinthian, what you were saying was he was wild and reckless and drunken and, and probably a fornicator too, that he was just as wild as he could be. Uh, and, and so that little expression, to live like a Corinthian, was a common expression in that day and time. And so Paul is going into the midst of something like that where there, yes, there are Jews and there are some Gentiles who know God from the synagogues, but a lot of the city is given over to immorality. And that's why Paul deals a lot with morality in the letter to the Corinthians. There's a lot of moral issues there. Uh, let's talk for a minute about the city of Corinth. The city of Corinth was the capital of Achaia. You remember we talked about in the Roman letter, it pleased those of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution to, for the poor among the saints. Uh, Achaia was... A, uh, is, is Greece, is same thing. And the, the capital of that was Corinth at that time. The population of the city of Corinth was around 400,000 people. Uh, something I read the other day said it may have been as high as 500,000 people, half a million people. So it was a big city. It was the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. And where it was located, it was a strategic travel and trade center. Uh, from, you got traffic from the east and the west and from the north and the south because of where it was located. And so it was a very strategic travel center. That's why it was a great place for a church to start right there because you've got people coming through all the time who would get a chance to hear the gospel uh, from that church at Corinth. Um, 
The city, as I've already mentioned, was really given over to immorality, and so much so that even among their worshipers, they had idol worshipers in the city, and there was a temple there to the goddess Aphrodite. And in that temple, there were a thousand sacred prostitutes. I put the word sacred in quotation marks. Sacred, they would call them sacred. Sacred prostitutes. And that's how they worshiped. Uh, immorality and idolatry go hand in hand in the Bible. Over and over again, you'll see that. Uh, fornication and idolatry. And that's how they worshiped. They would go into those idols' temple and commit uh, ritual fornication with the priestesses there. That was their job. Uh, and and uh, this is the culture out of which the church of Corinth comes. Out of this culture where it's very common to go in there and worship in that temple by committing fornication with a temple priestess. And now they get called out by the gospel. And sometimes there's a temptation to go back to that old life. You know how that is. When you come out of sin, sometimes there's temptation to go back to your old habits. And Paul had to deal with that. That's why in chapter 6 he talks, he has a little section there, the last part of chapter 6, talking about fornication. Because it seemed like some of them were wanting to go back to that old lifestyle of living in fornication. And Paul saying, you can't do that and be pleasing to God. You're joined to the Lord now. Uh, you're not supposed to be joined to these harlots. That's not, that's not the way the Christians live. Uh, and you can see in chapter 6, and this is, a, this is sort of a capstone on the moral condition of the church. Chapter 6, verses 9, 10, and 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters, Notice how those two things are put together, by the way. Nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And here it comes. And such were some of you. Some of the members at Corinth were guilty of those very things in their past life. Okay? That's, what they, that's the way they lived. They were homosexuals and sodomites and adulterers and, and idolaters. That's what they were. And they came out of that. You were, you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So that was the culture out of which they came. And if you think about it, it's not radically different from what we have today in the world. We have a culture that's given over to immorality. Uh, maybe not worshiping idols, uh, although there may even be some of that with some of these other religions out there, but certainly given over to immorality, and you're, you're trying to get people to come out of that, to leave that, and to serve the Lord. And sometimes it's a struggle because they want to go back to that lifestyle. In fact, as I said earlier, when you go to starting with verse uh, uh, 12 and on down the end of the chapter, a whole section on fornication. Because you can't go back to that lifestyle. That's what you used to be, but you can't do that. That's, that's behind you now. That's, that's not the life of a Christian. So you need to make sure, verse 15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I take the members of Christ, make them members of a harlot? You can't do that. You can't live that way and be a Christian. So they, this, is, this is the culture, this is the circumstance uh, from which this church came. And yet in the midst of that, God says, I have many people in this city. That should be an encouragement to us because we look around the world today and, you know, every time I turn on the news, I, it doesn't take about five minutes and I say, this world is crazy. It is nuts. The stuff that's going on, the stuff that's being tolerated, the stuff that's being allowed and promoted, and yet you have the same thing in the first century. And just as God said to Paul, I still have many people in this city. God still has people in this world. We can find them. That's our job to try and find them, to try and reach out and find them. But they're there, uh, and the gospel will pull them in. But we've got we to gotta figure out who they are and use that gospel to bring them into Christ because they need, they need what we have. All right, questions or comments on any of that background information? Yes, Steve. I'd like to go back to names just a minute. There's only a few biblical names for the Lord's church in yeah. the Bible. Yeah. And it's confusing to me that uh, you can walk up to somebody on the street and they'll say, I'm a Christian. But truly, they're, they're, if they tell you what they really are, well, I'm a Methodist or I'm a Catholic, or those names are nowhere to be found. In the yeah. And you know the really sad part, to, to your point, I think it's a great point that you make. They call themselves Christians, but they're not. They're not. Because you have, you, you have to do something to be a Christian. What's the first thing you have to do to become a Christian? 
believe and, and, and be baptized. Yeah. And most of them haven't. They, they, they may believe in Jesus. They may believe he's the Son of God. But they haven't been baptized into Christ. You're not a Christian if you've not been baptized into Christ. You can sit there and jump up and down all day long and say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But if you've not been baptized into Christ, you're not. You're still in your sins. Yes. The first thing you've got to do is have a change of heart. If you don't change your yeah. allegiance to Christ, it's yeah. not, not going to be any Yeah, just being baptized in yeah. itself. That's a great point, too. Just being baptized by itself is not yeah. enough. There has to be that commitment, that change from what I was to what I'm becoming. That is, that is so true. Uh, but, you know, you have these kind, and they're nice people. Don't misunderstand me. You know that. I don't have to tell you that. They're nice people, and they're religious people, and they're sincere people. But if they've not been baptized for remission of sins, they are not Christians. And that's important. They're not members of the body of Christ. Yes. Next time you have a discussion with a Baptist and he tells you that John was a Baptist, ask them which kind he was. Yeah. A free will Baptist, a primitive Baptist, a yeah. first Baptist, a general Baptist, and there's many, many more. Yeah. Uh, if they're really on top of things, they will give you an answer. Uh, that he was a missionary Baptist because he was sent on a mission, <laughs> but most of them wouldn't have a clue. Yeah. Well, you know, Baptists are kind of like uh, Heinz 57. There are 57 different varieties, you know, of Baptists. You're exactly right. So many different. And you have the old, what they used to call the old hard shell Baptists. Those are the staunch, strict, five point Calvinists. Now, a lot of these other Baptists, they don't swallow all five points of Calvinism. You know, they might swallow total depravity, that you're born a sinner, and they might swallow that once saved, always saved. But on some of that other stuff, they're a little wishy-washy on. Like, did Jesus die for everybody? A lot of them will say, yeah, Jesus died for everybody. But the strict, hard-shell, five-point Calvinists, they take the whole, they swallow that whole enchilada, all five points. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance. They swallow the whole enchilada. And, uh, but then you've got all these varieties in between. The missionary Baptists, if you stop and think about Calvinism, uh, if Calvinism be true, there's no reason to preach. That's just a fact. If, if, and if you swallow all five points of Cal, why preach? Because God has to zap you. Preaching ain't going to do it. God has to zap you with the Holy Spirit. You have to have that direct operation of the Holy Spirit. That's where that old mourner's bench used to come from. You were coming down and praying through till God zapped you. And so there's no point in preaching. It's a waste of time. And that was one of the things, I believe, historically, that brought about the missionary Baptists, because they didn't, they didn't take it that far. You know, they believed that you need to preach, and you need to go out and evangelize. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if God has to zap you, then God's to respect for persons, but why didn't he zap that one? Why didn't he zap that one? Uh, it would have been a useless thing to have the Bible grow. If, if that was true, <clears throat> then, then why did they preach? Then yeah. why was the Bible grow? Yeah. But anytime you, anytime you get away from the scripture, you're going to have so many contradictions and so many things that will not fit. When you read, just like the passage you talked about a while ago, which said they, you know, they heard and they was believing and were baptized, that fits right with what was taught in other passages, and it'll work and it and it makes sense and it, it you know it's reasonable. Yeah, you know? and it's not complicated. But the, the, the complicated up all this other stuff. To me, Paul was the closest thing to being zapped. And he still had things he had to do. Yeah. And you know, if I really believed that that stuff about once saved, always saved, if I really believed that, I'd take that thing right there and chuck it in the trash. That don't make a difference whether I read it or not. And I wouldn't bother coming here. I wouldn't come to church. Well, why bother? If I really believed in once saved, always saved, why bother? You're going to be saved anyway, right? And whether I come to church or not, whether I read my Bible or not, whether I worship God or not, I'm going to be saved anyway. And that might be a conversation point with your Baptist friends. If you really believe that, why don't you just chuck that and go live like a heathen? Because it isn't going to matter anyway. You're still going to go to heaven, right? <laughs> yeah. I hate the baptized. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that once saved, always saved is an invitation to low living. That's exactly what it is. Because it doesn't matter how you live, so why not live it up? Why not live like a Corinthian, as we said earlier? Why not? 
the earth and also heaven. And, and then go to heaven once over, yeah. Live it up here on the earth in sin and then go to heaven once over. And, and it defies logic, really, when you yeah. think about it. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. Because then, then their preachers will get right up and teach, you know, <clears throat> that you need to try to live morally or they'll teach some thoughts. Yep. Uh, well, why? You know, I mean, it, that, 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 just, that doctrine just contradicts the rest of what they try to do today. That is true. That is so true. Yeah. But really, the truth is you're a happy living in the Christian life and you are a wild life. Yeah. That, it don't matter that is true. Which way, you're still happier yeah. to do what God You'll have a better life, life <coughs> all the way around. It's that's, happier. That's for sure. <coughs> now, real quick, I've got about five minutes. I want to kind of give you a bird's eye view of the, of the book itself. First four chapters, if you're writing this stuff down, first four chapters deal with that division problem uh, uh, centering on preacheritis. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas and I'm of Christ. So he deals with that, takes him four chapters. So that was probably their biggest problem because uh, he, he writes about it extensively. In chapters 5, 6, and 7, problems with morality. In chapter 5, you had the man that was living with his father's wife, committing fornication with his father's wife. Uh, in chapter 6, you had the brethren taking one another to court over trivial matters, uh, suing one another. Uh, in the latter part of chapter 6, you had the issue of fornication, uh, and that had to be dealt with. And in chapter 7, uh, a discussion of marriage, and that's a moral issue too. You know, who can marry, who can't marry, uh, how permanent is marriage, what if you're married to an unbeliever, all that stuff comes in. But those are moral questions. So chapter 5, 6, and 7 has to do with morality. Chapter 8, 9, and 10, and they do go together, even though they don't seem like it, deals with the Christian liberty. It's kind of along the lines of Romans 14 that we discussed, but with a different twist. In, in Romans, it was uh, the, the, uh, the meats that had been uh, the clean and unclean meats of the Jewish law, and in Corinthians, it was the meats that had been sacrificed to idols. So it was, this, it was a similar issue, but different, different application. But in chapter 8, he deals with the problem, eating meat sacrificed to idols. In chapter 9, even though it seems unrelated, Paul goes into great detail talking about his right to be supported. And the reason he goes into that whole detail about his right to be supported is because he's making the point is, I had the right, but I gave it up. Okay? And that goes back to chapter 8, remember? If meat makes my brother to offend, I will no longer eat meat. And Paul says, sometimes we've got to give up our rights to be right with God. Uh, we, we can't always demand our rights. It's not always right to do what you have a right to do. That's Christianity. And so Paul uh, shows himself as being the example. He says, I've given up some of my rights, and you ought to be willing to give up some of your rights in order to be a Christian and bring more people in. And then chapter 10 concludes that discussion about idolatry. Though even though you might have the right to eat meat sacrificed to an idol, you can't worship the idol. So while an idol is nothing, chapter 8, idolatry is something, chapter 10. See, so that's a subtle distinction that you have to pick up on. An idol is nothing. That's just a piece of wood or stone, and a lot of people knew that, uh, and so that's fine. But to worship that idol is another matter altogether, and that's wrong. So chapter 10 brings that around full circle. So chapter 8, 9, and 10, problem with liberties. Chapters 11 through 14, problems relative to public worship. Uh, you had the discussion of the, of the woman's head covering, and... Uh, then you have the discussion of the Lord's Supper. Those are both in chapter 11. And then uh, uh, chapter 12, 13, 14, the spiritual gifts. Uh, the fact that every gift is needed, chapter 12. Uh, that love is a more excellent way than fighting over the gifts, chapter 13. And then the regulation of the gifts in their public assemblies, chapter 14. Chapter 15 dealt with false teaching about the resurrection. There were some saying there is no resurrection which is kind of bizarre because to become a Christian, you have to believe in a resurrection, don't you? Starting with the resurrection of Christ. You have to believe he was raised from the dead or you can't be a Christian. So, but they, they had some there denying the resurrection. And then chapter 16, concluding remarks, uh, the collection for the saints, the, his, Paul's upcoming visit, and then greetings and salutations. And that leaves us about a minute or two. Anybody have any closing questions or comments? Next Sunday we will... Uh, jump into chapter 1 and start getting into the text.